ago, uh, 8.30, and so we're celebrating vision research, and today we have a giant of our field. Uh, that's incredible pleasure and privilege of having him today. So, Jennings, this is really interesting area of research that evolved so quickly lately uh, on the different cell types. So, how many cell types do we have in the retina? Who knows? There's a lot. Um, does that <laughs> all the subtypes? Yes. I'd say over 100, maybe 120. So today we were going to get a, a precise number because uh, we have a leader in our field, Joe Saint, and he's going to uh, tell us uh, about the recent development. But before, uh, let Jennings uh, do introduction. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jennings Liu, and I'm an MD-PhD candidate from the Palchewski Laboratory. Today, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, the Jeff Tarr Professor of Molecular and Cellular Biology from Harvard University. After obtaining his bachelor's degree in biochemistry and psychology at Yale College, he completed his graduate studies and earned his master's and PhD in neurobiology from Harvard. He then completed postdoctoral training at Harvard and at UCSF, subsequently holding professorships at Washington University School of Medicine and Caltech prior to returning to Harvard to serve in his current role. Over the course of his career, he's served on numerous scientific advisory and editorial boards, and he's authored over 400 peer-reviewed articles, receiving over 57,000 citations with an H index of 130. He's also been the recipient of many prestigious honors and awards, including his induction into the National Academy of Sciences in 2002. As a neurobiologist, his research focuses on complex neural circuits in the mammalian brain and retina, utilizing transgenic models and genetic methods to map neural connections and understand signaling molecules that mediate their connectivity. Today, we have the privilege of hearing about his latest work, presenting a molecular perspective on retinal injury, disease, and evolution. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Joshua Sainz. All right, well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Can everybody hear me all right and see the screen? Yes. yes. Okay. So, um, well, it's a pleasure to uh, be there or not be there as the case may be, uh, but at least have the chance to see you virtually. Um, so uh, for the past six years, I guess, my colleagues and I have been uh, just obsessed with single cell transcriptomics. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. But I'll spend just a couple of minutes uh, giving you some background on how we uh, got into it. Um, the interest in the lab for about 15 years before that was in synaptic specificity, how it is that axons choose the right partners, uh, and in some cases, the right part of the right partner on which to make their synapses. And we, um, after a little bit of playing around, decided to use the retina as a model system in which to study this issue. Um, I don't think I have to um, really introduce the retina uh, to an ophthalmology group, but in case there's some anterior segment surgeons there, let me just give you a couple of minutes introduction. Uh, the retina, here's a sketch of a cross section, has uh, three cellular layers. I think that my screen is not, there we go. Three cellular layers separated by two synaptic layers. There are photoreceptors in the outermost layer. Um, they're light detectors. Uh, they pass their signals on to interneurons in the middle layer called the um, inner nuclear layer. And those interneurons process the information and then pass it on to retinal ganglion cells uh, in the uh, innermost layer, the ganglion cell layer. And as a consequence of very precise and specific patterns of connectivity between uh, interneurons and individual retinal ganglion cell types, the ganglion cells turn out to be not light detectors as photoreceptors are, but feature detectors. In other words, really the best stimulus you can give a photoreceptor is to turn the light on and off whereas that's quite a mediocre stimulus for many retinal ganglion cells, which instead um, turn out to be uh, specialized 
to respond selectively to particular visual features or combinations of features like motion, motion in a particular direction, orientation, uh, and so forth. And we thought that this inner plexiform layer was the perfect place for us to look at synaptic specificity because of these very highly specific patterns of connectivity that arise in mice in very early postnatal life in which each type of interneuron would synapse on only a few types of ganglion cells and each type of ganglion cell would receive uh, inputs from only several different interneurons. So um, in the end, I'm gonna to try to convince you of this. The retina is just as complicated as other parts of the brain, but has a lot of features that allow one to ask such questions uh, at a level of precision that would be very difficult in, let's say, the uh, cerebral cortex. So what we did was, over a period of years, generate or obtain a large number of transgenic lines that would mark one or more uh, of these individual cell types, mostly retinal ganglion cells, but also some interneurons. And that allowed us to have access to them uh, so that we rec could record for them from them. Uh, find out what genes they expressed, uh, overexpress or knock out those genes, and then look at the consequences both morphologically and physiologically by targeting uh, the labeled cells for uh, patch clamp recording. And so over this period of years, we managed to uh, make some headway in finding a set of adhesion molecules, recognition molecules, uh, and transcription factors that play some role in setting up the wiring that supplies three types of retinal ganglion cells listed here. So that was good, but it became apparent that we weren't going to be able to take this project uh, to completion, nor could my students, nor my students' students. Um, and one of the main reasons was that we just had no idea of how many types of interneurons and how many types of ganglion cells uh, there were. These were the estimates uh, when we started. And this kind of heterogeneity had been appreciated for you know, close to 150 years. This is one of Ramoni Cajal's beautiful drawings, but we still didn't have any way to really take an authoritative census uh, of retinal cell diversity. And so we tried uh, various approaches um, that failed and we were sort of saved by the invention of high throughput single cell and now single nucleus RNA sequencing. And that finally made it possible to get gene expression profiles from so many individual cells in short enough time and with low enough cost that one could envision sort of finishing the project. And actually, uh, single cell RNA-seq uh, was invented three times, essentially simultaneously. And I'm highlighting the version called DropSeq, invented by Evan McCosco, who was a postdoctoral fellow in Steve McCarroll's lab at Harvard Medical School, because as he was working out the method, um, we had the privilege to collaborate with Evan um, because he realized that we knew enough about the retina that that would be a good system to benchmark the method, uh, improve it, uh, and validate the results. And so, um, this is the first uh, large data set that Evan generated. Um, it shows in what's called a TISNY plot. I'll later show you something similar called UMAP plots uh, of the nearly 45,000 cells that he um, generated, uh, profiled, I should say. And in this sort of plot, I'm sure you know that the color and arrangement of the cells uh, gives you an idea of what the computer thought were cells that were similar enough to each other transcriptomically to be potentially uh, single cell types. And because it was the retina, we could look at genes selectively expressed in these individual clusters and ask whether uh, that, that supposition was true. And it was. Um, it turned out that each cluster had hallmarks of either a single cell type or maybe a small group of closely related cell types. They're shown here. <clears throat> and if we looked at the um, transcriptomic similarity of the cells, which is shown by the dendrogram on the left, um, it turned out that even their similarities made sense. All of the amacrine interneurons were each other's closest relatives, rod and cone photoreceptors were each other's closest relatives and so forth. 
So it was good, but not good enough because there were only 39 clusters. And we already knew at that time that there were at least 60 cell types. And, and that's probably seen most dramatically if you look at the retinal ganglion cells, there was only a single ganglion cell cluster, even though, again, at that time, we knew that there were more than 10 uh, ganglion cell types. And, and so the problem turned out to be that even though 45,000 cells is an awe-inspiring large number, uh, most of those cells are rod photoreceptors. And that meant for rare types like retinal ganglion cells that are less than 1% of all the cells, there were only going to be barely 200 uh, or a bit more in the data set. And we now know there are 40 types. I'll come to that in a minute. So there were only 10 cells or less per type. So we probably missed uh, rare types, and more important, there weren't enough types for the computer to pick them out. Uh, there weren't enough cells of each type for the computer to uh, pick them out and individualize them. So we realized that what we had to do was to take the heterogeneous classes, the ganglion cells, amacrine interneurons, and bipolar interneurons, and enrich them so we could get enough cells uh, to bring things to completion. And we did that using markers and transgenic lines and fact sorting. <clears throat> and in the end, we were able to uh, profile uh, each of these three types, classes, I should say, and find 15 types of bipolar cells, 46 types of retinal ganglion cells, and 63 types of amacrine cells. And in each case, we could find genes selectively expressed uh, by individual types and then use them by immunohistochemistry or in situ hybridization to ask whether the types that the computer nominated correspond to types that neuroscientists would care about, that is ones that shared morphological or physiological features. And that turned out to be true for all 15 of the bipolar types. Uh, we looked at all of them for many of the ganglion cell types that we looked at um, and for at least some of the amacrine cell types. So the upshot is that uh, by three years or so ago, we had what we think is pretty close uh, to a complete retinal cell atlas for the mouse. Um, 130 or so neuronal types. There's probably more than 10 non-neuronal types. So maybe the total number is gonna be somewhere between 140 and 150. And of course, it won't surprise anybody if one or two more types get discovered, but, but we feel like we're pretty close to completion. So what I'm also showing on this slide is the fact that the number of known types doubled uh, in a period of less than 10 years. The number 65 uh, comes from an influential review that Dick Masland, uh, a retinal pioneer, published in 2012. Um, and the increase over the subsequent years, of course, came from many sources. It's a big field, but I think it's single cell RNA-seq that really contributed the most to giving us a, a full atlas. So once we had the atlas, um, we built it in hopes that it would be useful. And we decided to uh, test that proposition by using it to ask biologically interesting questions. And so we spent the past several years trying to learn a bit about development, which of course is what motivated us in the first place. We've expanded the retinal atlas uh, to a whole human eye atlas that allows us to look at the expression uh, of a lot of genes that have been implicated in ocular diseases. I'm not gonna talk about either of those, but rather uh, talk today about the last two. One about uh, responses of retinal cells to injury. I'll talk about that rather quickly because that work has been published recently. And then I'll talk in a bit more detail about a rather new evolution project um, that, that has not been published, although we have high hopes that at one point it will be publishable. So for injury, um, we several years ago actually began collaborating with Shigong He at Children's Hospital, who's, I would say, one of the world's expert uh, in looking at the responses of retinal ganglion cells to injury and trying to improve uh, their responses because it's known that uh, in a mouse at least, and it's true for lots of mammals, not non-mammalian species, if you sever the axons of retinal ganglion cells just outside uh, the orbit, the uh, axons degenerate, of course, and then most of the retinal ganglion cells die, 80% or so in two weeks, 
90% uh, by a month. And then very few of the axons regenerate, even amongst the few survivors. Um, but Jagong and others have found various interventions that promote some amount of regeneration of the survivors, um, but there aren't that many survivors and the amount of regeneration is nowhere near clinically useful. So we decided to use uh, RNA-seq uh, to address this issue uh, in three ways that I'll go through uh, quickly. First, we wanted to know whether ganglion cell types uh, differ in their susceptibility to injury. And the idea here is that if 80% of the retinal ganglion cells die at one extreme, it could be that 80% die of uh, that 80 die of each type, or at the other extreme, that all of the cells die of 80% of the types, and all of the cells live of the other 20% of the types. And of course, that would be quite useful because you could find out what's making the resilient cells live. You might be able to endow uh, the vulnerable cells with that quality, uh, or you might be able to get rid of the toxic genes within the vulnerable cells. And we went on to look at the gene expression profiles uh, with injury and intervention. And then as I just alluded to, see if we could uh, find uh, out whether some of the genes that we identified uh, could serve as new therapeutic targets. So in terms of um, cell type specificity, uh, we began with some work with the transgenic lines I mentioned before. I, I won't go into that, um, but talk just about the way we uh, did it more comprehensively with single cell transcriptomics. And the method was simple. We looked at the uh, frequency of all of the 46 retinal ganglion cell types. The most abundant one is about 8% of all the ganglion cells. The least abundant one we could find is uh, just a few tenths of a percent. And then we crushed the optic nerve and repeated the experiment at various times after crush, and then just divided the frequencies after crush uh, with those in controls to get a measure of resilience. And so here are the results uh, two weeks uh, after crush when only 20% of the cells survive. <clears throat> and you can see two things here. First, indeed, there are dramatic cell type differences in susceptibility and vulnerability, is susceptibility and resilience to injury. So the most resilient type survives to the tune of more than 90%, and the most vulnerable type dies to the tune of 99%. The other thing you can see is that it's not uh, a binary division into resilient and vulnerable types. Instead, there's sort of a gradient uh, going from the very most resilient to the very most vulnerable, which stops uh, essentially 46 uh, points along the way. So we also uh, looked in uh, to the transcriptomes of the resilient and vulnerable types and found some genes that were selectively, although not uniquely, uh, expressed in the resilient or vulnerable types. Now, I'll come back to that in a few seconds, but first talk about uh, the second set of experiments here. And that was one in which we wanted to get a sense of what are the mechanisms of survival and particularly the mechanisms used by interventions that Jagong and others had uh, shown can promote some survival and promote some axon regeneration. And so what we did was to use three interventions that Zhigong had uh, worked out, and they're all very robust. They've been um, confirmed by other labs, so we can really trust them. And they are um, enhancing mTOR signaling by deleting its endogenous inhibitor, uh, a gene called P10. And we do that in a conditional deletion just in retinal ganglion cells, so we're not looking at uh, body-wide or even retina-wide uh, effects of mTOR signaling. Another one is to, uh, in a ganglion cell-specific method, delete uh, the transcription factor SOX3, which is an endogenous inhibitor of JAK-STAT signaling. So we increase JAK-STAT signaling. And the third is to overexpress the neurotrophic factor CNTF. And on the bottom here, you can see essentially our replication of results that others had published, showing that if you uh, impose one, two, or three of these interventions, 
you enhance the number of cells that survive and the number of axons that regenerate. Um, not all of them, but about 50% survival. Uh, and of those surviving cells, a small but increasing fraction with more interventions are able to regenerate axons uh, at, at the arbitrary value of 1.5 millimeter regeneration. So we then used these interventions and did two experiments. The first was to isolate the ganglion cells in the ways I've shown um, and do single cell RNA seq uh, in, at control times two, seven days and three weeks after the nerve crush for the three sets of interventions I showed you, and then analyze their gene expression computationally in a variety of ways. The other experiment was to back label regenerating axons. And the reason to do that was that once we found out that only a small fraction of cells of any given type regenerate axons, um, we wanted to know whether there are any gene expression differences between cells within a type that just survive or that survive and regenerate. And so to that end, Anne Jacoby in the lab uh, developed this retrograde labeling method in which she puts a fluorescent dye uh, far enough away uh, from the retina that it isn't taken up by uh, axon stumps, uh, but close enough that it is taken up by regenerating axons. And then she could go back into the retina, and you're seeing here a whole mount retina, and the little red dots uh, are the back-labeled uh, retinal ganglion cells. And she could isolate them and also isolate non-regenerating ganglion cells, all of which were labeled uh, by YFP, and then perform single-cell sequencing on them, uh, in this case by a, a, a deeper sequencing method called SmartSeq2. So putting all of those data together, and I won't go through the intermediate details because I said this was published a couple of months ago. Um, what uh, Ann Jacoby and Nick Tran uh, and Wenjun Yan, who were the three leads on this study, found was that essentially there are three gene expression modules that we can find that are associated to a large uh, extent with uh, three types of cells. Some with cells that are destined to die, some with cells that survive but don't regenerate, and some with cells that survive and regenerate. And putting it together, we've come up with sort of a simple model uh, of how we think it all works. So in controls with no intervention, what happens is that the cell death genes are activated shortly after optic nerve crush, and then their expression increases over a period of weeks. It turns out that the survival and regeneration genes are also activated, but their activation isn't sustained. They turn back off after a few days, and that's when the cells die and fail to regenerate. In contrast with the interventions, I'm just showing you the triple intervention here. What happens is that the cell death genes are activated, but their activation is not sustained. They're turned back off. Uh, by presumably the increased mTOR and JAK stat signaling. The regeneration and survival genes turned on, and in this case, their activation is increased and maintained. And so what you end up with are cells that survive, some of which also regenerate. Now, if you look here, you can see that some of the regeneration and survival genes turn on before nerve crush. And it's not uh, because uh, they have extrasensory perception, it's because we had to um, knock out P10 and SOX3 using an uh, adeno-associated virus sometime before uh, we did the optic nerve crush so that we would get rid of those genes by the time the crush happened. And so you can think of this as sort of a conditioning effect in which the ganglion cells by the time of injury may already be predisposed to survive and regenerate. And so it's gonna be important in the future to see whether we can uh, impose the interventions at or after uh, the injury and, and see whether they'd still be as effective. <clears throat> so at any rate, from all the experiments I've told you, looking at cell types and looking at these modules, um, we came up with a, a number of genes that seem to be associated with survival and regeneration. This is showing you some networks of genes associated with regeneration. Um, 
and particularly of interest are ones that are hormones, uh, hormone signaling genes, uh, neuropeptides, neuropeptide receptors and the like. And they also turned up uh, in the uh, original optic nerve crush method. And they're kind of intriguing because hormones and neuropeptides, of course, are well suited uh, to be therapeutic agents because they're already there. Uh, one knows that they're generally non-toxic and they're fairly easy to administer. And so we looked at a few of them um, and the experimental setup here was to crush the optic nerve, then overexpress uh, in what I'm gonna show you or knock down in other genes, in, in other cases that I won't show you, uh, using a CRISPR-based method, uh, these various genes in retinal ganglion cells. And then uh, at uh, three weeks later, label all the cells antrograde uh, with cholera toxin, and then just look at uh, the ganglion cells and the optic nerve for regeneration. And so here are results from uh, three genes, uh, two uh, neuropeptides, corticropin releasing hormone and galanin, and a transcription factor that's been implicated in the regulation uh, of neuropeptides called WT1. In each case, we could go to Anne's uh, regeneration versus survival uh, expression data and confirm that indeed all three of these are expressed at substantially higher levels in those ganglion cells uh, that uh, regenerate as opposed to those that survive but don't regenerate. And to make a long story short, all three of them uh, enhance axon regeneration. You can see that here in whole mounts uh, of optic nerves in a crush, as I already told you, without an intervention, there's barely any regeneration. With these uh, three overexpression uh, paradigms, you get regeneration. I should emphasize that it's not nearly enough to be clinically useful. Um, you also get some degree of increased survival, but at least it is sort of a proof of principle. And one might imagine combining some of these uh, interventions uh, or maybe going downstream to find common signaling factors that are downstream of, let's say, multiple uh, neuropeptides or neurohormones. So let me take the last, uh, I guess, uh, looks to me like about 20 minutes. Um, and tell you about this uh, project that is now, I hope, just coming to completion uh, about the evolution of retinal cell types. <clears throat> now, we started with that actually not thinking about evolution at all, um, but thinking about the human retina. And, and here's the idea. The mouse retina, I believe, is just a nearly perfect preparation for looking at the structure and function and development of uh, neural circuits. And, and indeed, I've uh, based uh, the last 20 years of my scientific life on believing that that's the case. However, it is an absolutely terrible model uh, for studying vision. And it's not just because the mouse retina is small, it's because the human retina has key features that are critically important for vision that are just lacking in mice. And two of them are regional specializations uh, and unique cell types that just are not found in mice. And, and I'll say a little bit about the uh, regional specializations first, uh, and then come back to the unique cell types uh, towards the end. So the regional specializations, you probably know this, are the fovea, which is embedded in a slightly larger macula. The fovea uh, occupies only 1% or so of the entire retinal area in us humans, um, but it accounts for almost all of our high acuity vision. Uh, and you know that because it's, uh, you know it's directly behind the lens. So when you look straight at something, the image falls on the fovea. And I'm sure you all know, and you can try this out at home, that if you want to see something, you have to look right at it. And if there's things off to the side that fall on your peripheral retina, you're not very good at seeing them, especially with high acuity. The macula that's surrounding um, is selectively affected in a large number of diseases, AMD and so forth. And the point here is that primates are the only mammals that have a macular phobia. So you just can't study that quality in mice. And maybe that helps explain why mouse models of macular degeneration haven't been uh, extremely useful. 
So people have studied the fovea um, morphologically and physiologically for decades. And we know a lot about its specializations. Um, morphologically, for at least 150 years, we've known that, for example, the cone photoreceptors look differently, uh, look different in the fovea than, than in the periphery. Uh, there's some great physiology from Fred Rieke at University of Washington, his colleagues, about physiological differences. Um, and we know that their wiring is different. The extent of convergence is far higher in the periphery, uh, an adaptation for sensitivity, whereas the convergence is vastly less in the fovea, which is an adaptation for acuity. But nobody had known anything substantial about molecular differences that might underlie some of these uh, morphological and physiological differences. And so Irong Peng in the lab took that on, beginning with macaques. She dissected out uh, the fovea and uh, then took large pieces of the periphery, subjected them to the sort of single cell RNA-seq methods that I've described for you, uh, in many cases selecting to enrich for ganglion cells and bipolar cells, <laughs> and came up um, with atlases of the macaque uh, and then the human and then the marmoset uh, which is a genetically accessible primate that's becoming uh, more popular for neurobiological research. Um, the reason I wrote more cells here is to remind me to tell you that the larger number of types we find in humans than macaques and marmosets may not be real. It's probably just because we have way more cells for human than macaque, and therefore we've been better able to capture uh, rare cell types. But for all three of them, it's interesting that there are substantially fewer cell types uh, than there are in mouse, despite the fact that we think that we humans are superior to mice in all respects. Now, because um, Irong had gotten data from fovea and periphery separately, um, she was able to ask how they differ. Uh, do they have different cell types? Do they have the same types but with different proportions? <clears throat> Is it that Types that are common to uh, fovea and periphery uh, have differential gene expressions. That is, they're similar enough that we can confidently call them the cell same type, but nonetheless, they have some differences in expression. And this isn't really what I want to talk about today, but uh, the upshot is that the cell types are almost entirely shared. We don't know at this point of any cell types that are unique to either the fovea or the periphery, at least not with great confidence. There are some differences in proportion. Uh, for example, the fovea has been known for ages to be cone dominated, and therefore uh, cone bipolar cells are way more uh, abundant in the fovea than rod bipolar cells. The opposite is true in the periphery. But the biggest difference is that for all of these shared types, which as I said, is essentially all types, um, there are differentially expressed genes. Uh, depending on the threshold you use, that number varies, but it can be on the order of between a few tens to a few hundreds per cell type. And so Irong, who's now in her own lab at UCLA, uh, is taking on the job of finding out whether any of these genes underlie the morphological and physiological differences between fovea and periphery uh, that we've known about for a long time. So as we uh, got these data, we decided to think a little more broadly and look at cell type conservation more generally uh, amongst vertebrates. And we think the retina is perfect for this kind of uh, project because its general structure and general cell classes are almost perfectly conserved amongst all vertebrates. They all have the same six classes, photoreceptors, horizontal, bipolar, and amacrine interneurons, retinal ganglion cells, and Mueller glia. They all have the same three cellular layers uh, and two synaptic layers, and you can see that for uh, eight species here on the right, in which we've stained bipolars, amacrines, and retinal ganglion cells with class-specific markers. So we began gathering retinas uh, from species that uh, basically uh, researchers were going to euthanize but not use the eyes. And we've ended up now with atlases for 17 species uh, that span uh, not only mammals, 
uh, but but uh, three not four non mammalian species. And so now we can begin to use those atlases to look at the conservation uh, of cell classes and cell types. Now for classes, uh, as I said, we already knew that they're conserved um, morphologically and to the extent it's been studied physiologically, but it wasn't clear the extent to which there was molecular conservation. And I'm showing you the results here uh, from the first four we looked at, a uh, chick, two primates, uh, and a mouse, because uh, it's easier to see. And what you can see here by a dendrogram is that there is near perfect conservation. So all of the photoreceptors cluster together, the amacrins cluster together. One type of amacrin is different. Uh, if you want to ask me about that later, we can talk about that. Horizontal cells, Mueller glia, ganglion cells, and bipolar cells, and so forth. And that perfect conservation is even true for subclasses, cones and rod photoreceptors, glycinergic and gabergic amacrine cells, uh, and on and off bipolar cells, although I'm not uh, showing you that here. And it's really pretty remarkable. If, if you look here, a glycinergic amacrine cell from a chicken is more like a glycinergic amacrine cell from a mouse than it is like a gabaergic amacrine cell from a chicken. So there's very high conservation across classes and subclasses. And to the extent that we know uh, about transcription factors that specify these classes and subclasses, they seem to be very conserved as well. So we're hypothesizing that the programs that lead to specification are evolutionarily ancient. And here, I know you can't see it, but just to make the point that this class and subclass specification is true for all 17 of the species that we've looked at. Now, types were a little bit harder. When we looked at the types, I'm just showing you the mammals here, and clustered them together, instead of having types dominate the clustering, species dominated the clustering. So species-specific gene profiles dominated over type-specific profiles. And so what Karthik Shekhar and Josh Hahn did was to use a so-called batch correction method to essentially minimize the species-specific genes. Uh, and then they ended up finding clusters, each of which contain um, retinal ganglion cells, in this case, from many, and in some cases, all species. So let me stop and point out that Karthik Shekhar was a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, um, but has since moved to um, UC Berkeley at, as a faculty member. And so we're now continuing this project as a collaboration. And uh, his graduate student, Josh Hahn, has taken really the lead role uh, in all the computation that I'm showing you here and, and we'll keep on telling you about. So you can now take these clusters and we're calling them orthotypes. Uh, we can separate them and there are 21 retinal ganglion cell orthotypes, which are groups of cells from many, and as I say, in many cases, all of the species we're looking at that seem to be, at least computationally, potentially related to each other. And the same is true for bipolar orthotypes, of which we have uh, at this point 14. So let me just show you for bipolars what the orthotypes are like. So if we take the mouse types um, and then map them onto these orthotypes, there's a one-to-one -one match. That is the bipolar type 1A in the mouse uh, is almost entirely contained with one single orthotype. And because of that one-to-one -one mapping, we've named the orthotypes by their mouse name. So, uh, Mouse orthotype BC1A contains mouse uh, type BC1A and, and so on and so forth. And so now we can look at what other uh, species uh, cell types uh, show up in these bipolar orthotypes. And what you can see is that there's a pretty good close to one-to-one -to -one matching for all the other mammals. As you get more evolutionarily distant in lizard, chick, and zebrafish, the matching is less good, still substantial for chick, uh, not quite so good for lizard, and really quite awful for zebrafish. We don't know the extent to which there's evolutionary divergence that has uh, separated uh, these cell types. 
or whether it's a matter that as you add more genes, uh, as you add more species, uh, the number of orthologous genes goes down. And so we have uh, less material to use for the conservation. Same sort of story for retinal ganglion cells, fairly good conservation amongst mammals, uh, not so good amongst the non-mammalian species. So this has given us just a world of interesting things to look at. And I'm going to end with just uh, one of them due to lack of time. And that is to go back to the um, unique cell types in primates. Those are the midget and parasol retinal ganglion cells. And they're incredibly important because uh, nearly 90% of uh, retinal ganglion cells in us and in macaques are uh, midget, so-called midget retinal ganglion cells, so called because they have small somata and small dendritic arbors, and another five to 10% are parasol retinal ganglion cells. And so, you know, we really see to some extent with our midgets and maybe with our midgets and parasols, you could imagine that if somebody lost their midgets, they'd be blind. But if they lost some of these other uh, 15, 16, 17 minor cell types, it might not be all that terrible. And so far, nobody has found a midget or parasol ortholog in more accessible species like rodents. And so it's been difficult, uh, again, same sort of story as the fovea, to look at what uh, the special molecular or functional properties of these cells might be, uh, let alone their resilience to disease. And indeed, when we had the mouse and macaque and human atlases, we tried looking for orthologs and we failed completely. So the idea was to revisit this issue with the orthotype analysis, and, and this is what we did. So we looked at the orthotypes that contained the on and off midgets and the on and off parasol cells uh, from macaques, humans, and marmosets. And then we looked at what orthotypes were present from mouse uh, in those same clusters. And what we found interestingly was that there were one or a few in each orthotype and one in each orthotype and the majority of them overall turned out to be a very well studied uh, subclass of mouse ganglion cells called alpha cells. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, seemed a bit unlikely because alpha cells are known for being big and midgets are known for being small. Alpha cells are known for being rare and midgets are known for being abundant. Um, but we've ended up with other lines of evidence that suggest that uh, there is a real relationship. One is uh, that they match by polarity. Uh, you, you probably know, I may not have said it, that many types, including these, come in on and off flavors. On meaning they respond selectively to increases in illumination, off respond selectively to decreases in illumination. And so there's a perfect match there. We also know about their kinetics, the midgets and uh, the C2, C3, so-called sustained alpha cells all give sustained responses when you turn the light on or off. Uh, whereas the C41 and C45 alphas and the on and off parasol cells are known for giving very transient responses. But maybe most interesting is that we know so much about these cells in both macaques and humans that we know what are the bipolar cell types that innervate them. And it turns out in each case, the major type of bipolar that innervates the primate type is in the same orthotype as the bipolar type that provides substantial uh, in a few cases and the majority in the other cases uh, of bipolar input to these types. So putting it all together, we feel that we really have found um, rodent orthologs and indeed orthologs in many mammalian species, most mammalian species uh, of these all important primate types. So I'll finish with just a couple other similarities between alphas and midgets, particularly now, and one difference. Um, one similarity is that alphas and midgets uh, have very simple receptive fields. The sustained alpha cells that are the orthologs of the midgets are really not feature detectors in the way I described at the outset, but they provide a much more 
pixel-like image that's been contrast enhanced, but isn't, for example, motion sensitive. Another similarity is that the alphas um, project um, disproportionately to the lateral geniculate nucleus, which then supplies the cerebral cortex, rather than the superior colliculus, where many other uh, cells uh, uh, project. Uh, and the superior colliculus, in turn, seems to supply motor centers and underlie a lot of more reflexive behaviors. The difference I already mentioned is that the alphas are low abundance, midgets are high abundance. And I want to leave you with sort of a speculation that the similarities and the difference uh, may be uh, related. And so the idea is that we see an increased abundance of midgets uh, going from rodents to primates. Their abundance is very high in all three primates. You can see that here. It's low in all four of the rodents for which we have atlases, and it's intermediate in other mammalian species um, like pigs, tree shrews, opossums, ferrets, and sheep. And what's interesting is that there is an increased role of the cortex uh, along the very same axis. So in mouse, almost all of the ganglion cells project the superior colliculus and underlie reflexive behaviors. In the human, that number is low, less than 20%. Uh, and conversely, almost all retinal ganglion cells, uh, including all midgets, project to the lateral geniculate nucleus in humans and a minority uh, in mouse. And so what we're thinking is that the midgets are not primate innovations as had been supposed, but rather that their frequency increases as the importance of cortical vision processing increases. And the idea is that as the cortex plays uh, an increasingly important role, it needs more of a faithful representation of the visual world, not one that's been uh, overly pre-processed, so that the cortex can then use its flexibility to decide what to do about the visual information it's getting. And so in essence, the thought is that if you turf the visual processing back to the cortex, you lose a few milliseconds in response speed, but make up for it in the craftiness for which we primates are known. So um, to finish up, um, here are conclusions that we have at this point from our study of evolution. Uh, and I mentioned, I think most of them, the molecular identity of classes and subclasses is extremely highly conserved. Types are less well conserved, but the orthotype analysis that Karthik and Josh Hahn came up with gives us a way to find shared types across mammals and some across uh, other vertebrate orders. The conservation of types, I didn't say this, uh, didn't give the evidence for this, but it's uh, considerably more striking for outer retinal cells, photoreceptors, horizontal cells, and bipolars than it is for ganglion cells. And so we're speculating the evolution acts preferentially at the stage where information is being sent from the eye to the brain. Some transcription factors uh, that specify class, subclass, and type identity are conserved. So we believe that they're common developmental pathways and this analysis can highlight the ones that uh, may be most shared and most ancient. Um, and I talk quite a bit about the uh, orthologs of midget and parasol retinal ganglion cells uh, and suggested that they're not uh, a primate innovation, but rather types that were expanded in the primate lineage to uh, subserve the increased importance of cortical processing. So with that, um, here are the people who have done the work I described. This has been a huge project, uh, far larger and more collaborative than, than any other project I've been involved in. And I want to just highlight here particularly the people who played the key roles in the work on um, optic nerve crush. Those were Ann Jacoby, Nick Tran, and Wen Jun Yan. Uh, and this was all a collaboration with Zhigong He. Uh, you can see all three of them moved on to better lives at this point. Um, and the work on evolution uh, has been done by uh, Iran, who's now at UCLA, uh, and uh, Abuzar Manafashani, who's still in my lab, uh, and Karthik Shekhar at Berkeley, now at Berkeley, uh, and his graduate student, Josh Han. So with that, um, why don't I stop sharing and take questions?
fantastic. We have at least uh, 10 questions or more. Uh, so uh, if we could be concise, that would be great. I just wanted to start with one simple question. You missed the most important uh, cell in the eye, uh, which is RPE cell. We have profiled RPE actually, um, we love it, but it isn't in the neural retina and I'm a neurobiologist, so I give precedence to the neurons. Oh, very well, then we forgive you then. Yeah, uh, so we don't have, I should point out, we don't have um, RPE from all that many species though. So that that is a project waiting to be done. We have a question from Milika. Would you like me to read it out? I'm sorry. <laughs> Not sure. Okay, sure. Thank you, Dr. Sainz. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, my one question was, uh, I was wondering when you're looking at the RGC susceptibility to survival, uh, does the topographic position of the RGC in the retina or optic nerve influence their survival, you know, in terms of either or generation capacity, or they're just randomly scattered throughout the retina? Yeah, so all of the ganglion cell types are scattered throughout the retina in, in a mosaic arrangement. There, there, there are some modest uh, dorsal ventral gradients. Um, Rachel Wong has studied them the most. Um, so we couldn't tell from the type analysis where there was any regional specificity. Uh, Nick Tran did uh, some histological studies looking to see whether there was more death in one part of the retina or another. And all I can say is there was nothing obvious, no, which is different from glaucoma, by the way, which does show uh, regional differences. Dorota. Um, thank you very much. This was absolutely fantastic. Um, so I have actually a question and comment to the second part, to the evolution part. I um, I found it extremely interesting that retinal ganglion cells, uh, there's two types, uh, you find it specific for uh, mammals, but I think it's a little bit unfair that you compared uh, chicken to the uh, mammals and you didn't take any phobia, uh, I mean, any bird that has actually phobia to at least try to find uh, another ganglion cell, another type of ganglion cell, and also maybe uh, even go back to some kind of more complicated uh, retinas of uh, uh, of um, some lizards or, you know, so just to look for the for the common, common ancestor. Yeah, so um, lizard does have a phobia. And although in this particular study, we took the whole retina, um, we are very interested in looking at the phobia. For birds, I would say, if you can get an NIH grant to study eagles, we'll be ready. <laughs> These are not birds that are very easy to study. Okay. I think well, eagles have eagles, two phobias, so it would be great. Eagles are not the only ones, right? And so um, all of them, all of the ones that are flying long distances. And uh, if you, if well, you, but I understand your... Yeah, yeah. I understand if, your you can, comment. If you can supply the retina from a bird with a phobia. We're, we're there for you. Very well. Let's move to Brad. Oh, thank you, uh, Dr. Chains. I was um, curious to ask you if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit more about um, what you've demonstrated so so well here. This is really so fascinating. That is that uh, the transcriptomic similarities, um, nonetheless, uh, notwithstanding these similarities, you know, you wind up with such strong morphological differences, uh, physiologic differences, for example, between uh, alpha cells in mice and midget cells in primates. Um, but, you know, it turns out that alpha cell, alpha sustain, remember alpha sustained cells in mice and the midgets and primates, I'm no physiologist, but, but my understanding is they are actually rather similar. They're hmm. sustained. Um, they're basically contrast detectors. Mm -hmm. um, the alpha transients and the parasols are transient. They're very motion sensitive. Um, so they're shockingly similar, actually. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'd like to dig in further to, for example, direction selective cells and others and, and see what we can find out about that. Um, but, but we don't know that yet. Thank you. All right. I may say this name wrong, but Joel 
All right, let's move to Martha then. Martha, are you there? Sorry, man. I'm um, sorry. Were you saying my name before? Yes, I did. I'm sorry. I don't know how to say your first name. Gael, Gael. No worries. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, so my question was regarding your, you know, when you crushed um, the optic nerve um, and you, you found those different cell types with different kind of resilience core. Um, and then do you reckon this is intrinsically because of the, um, the function of our cells or you can somehow find like a linear regression, removing the identity of our cells that just find something that make them, you know, uh, more or less resilient. And if and if there's no uh, significant correlation, is it because maybe it's the microenvironment of our cells that give them this resilience, um, so, or is it some sort of stemness, or you know, is it intrinsic or extreme? Or yeah. Extreme? Um... So, so the only honest answer is I don't really know, but here are a few speculations. Uh, but, are you are you going to study it also? <laughs> if not, then uh, that could be something that. Uh, uh, yeah. Could, uh, well, I'll tell you what I think. Um, I mean, Zhigong, he is certainly going to study it more, me, me probably less, but Nick Tran now has a lab at Baylor where he is working on these problems. So all the ganglion cell types are intermixed. So they're not likely to be in different environments. So I'm guessing that it's more intrinsic than extrinsic based on that. Now, we don't know which are the important genes. So we can't um, regress them out and, and find out whether they are substantial, you know, whether that would rob a cell of its type identity if we took out the important genes. Um, some of the genes that we think may be important are present before crush, whereas others are only induced um, after crush. And so for those induced after crush selectively in some types, one would need to look upstream uh, for the transcriptional programs. And so we've done a so-called scenic analysis that gives one a sort of set of transcription factors and match targets. Uh, but and that's where this WT1 came from. But but we haven't dug into the meaning of that. All right, let's All right. move to three. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that wonderful talk. Uh, my question is regarding uh, uh, ganglion cell survival in your uh, optic nerve crush model. Um, is the cell death pathways that's involved uh, in ganglion cell death after optic nerve crush, the same as the cell death pathways that may be involved in ganglion cell dropout during de retinal development? Oh, nobody knows at all. I'm sorry. Because, the, I mean, I think, yeah, nobody knows at all. I'm sorry. All right, let's move to Marta if she's ready. Marta, are you ready? He's not ready, so we're moving to Alex. Thank you, Dr. Saints. Uh, I have a very naive question, actually. Um, so at the beginning, you showed that some of those RGCs are very rare, so less than 1%, let's say, of the pool. So I was wondering, what is the functional significance of such a small number of cells in the retina? Um, well, that is a really good question. <laughs> It, it, for only a few of them do we have an idea. And I, I'd point maybe to the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that run a lot of non-image forming functions, you, you know, like uh, uh, pupillary reflexes uh, and so forth, uh, circadian rhythm. Uh, there are several types of them and people are just beginning to sort of par parse out which of the non-image forming functions each one subserves. Um, but the upshot is they are among the very rarest types. And yet in those cases, you can find a really important function. Uh, for rare image forming ganglion cells, it's a bit, bit more of a mystery. And, and honestly, I don't have a good idea. Are melanopsin containing cells are more resilient or less resilient? And that varies by type. So the, the M1 type is pretty resilient. Um, and the on alpha sustained is actually a uh, melanopsin containing one. It's pretty resilient. Um, 
but some of the other alphas and some of the other IPRGCs are not at all resilient. <laughs> and so I can say more generally that, uh, of course, we looked really hard to see if we could figure out some rhyme or reason to which cells are resilient um, or, uh, or vulnerable, you, you know, by physiology or size or projection pattern. And we just couldn't find anything that made sense. All right, now I see that Marta is ready to answer the, uh, ask the question. I'm sorry, your I think your microphone's off. All right, let's go figure it out and let's move to Jennings. Well, hang on, I see I see her in the chat. Is this the one? It might also be interesting to compare macaque and marmoset to owl monkey as a nocturnal non-foveate primate. Was that the question? Yes. Okay, so it, it would be interesting. Um, we, we have not done that. Uh, there's sort of limited resources. Um, in terms of nocturnal and diurnal, one thing that we are still looking into is of the four rodents, uh, two are nocturnal and two are diurnal. And we need to dig in there and see if we can see any uh, signs other than rod and rod bipolar abundance that, that correspond to those different lifestyles. But we haven't really done that yet. Hi, Dr. Sainz, really enjoyed your talk. Uh, in terms of axon degeneration of the ganglion cells, I was wondering if you could comment on how other retinal cell types could contribute to or modulate that process and um, the degree of conservation of different species. So for instance, comparing uh, zebrafish with regenerative Miller glia and how that's lost in uh, high order species. So yeah, I mean, in most, in a lot of non mammalian species, certainly reptiles, fish, and amphibia, if you, cut or crush the optic nerve, there is excellent survival of the retinal ganglion cells and excellent regeneration. Um, I'm not sure how that corresponds to the ability of Mueller glia to uh, turn back into stem cells and regenerate, but probably corresponds pretty well. Um, there's a lot of retinal ganglion cell death in all mammals that have been looked at. Uh, following optic nerve crush, I don't know quantitatively. Um, in terms of other cells, there are retrograde changes following uh, damage to and um, death of the retinal ganglion cells. Um, it, it's not so clear what role that plays in their death. The Zhigong He has some interesting information that uh, amacrine cell, loss of amacrine cell contacts may play a role. Um, but I, I don't think that's been explored terribly well. Doug? Hi, Dr. Sainz. Thank you so much for that really amazing talk. Uh, so my question was also regarding the, <clears throat> regarding the optic nerve crush model. So was there kind of a molecular tipping point where retinal ganglion cells kind of shifted from an apoptotic or an exclusively survival-oriented kind of trajectory to a more survival and regeneration? trajectory. So I guess my question revolves around like, how far can RGCs deviate from like a homeostatic state? Yeah, no, that is a very good question. I think, um, again, I don't think we really know. I think to, I mean, it's possible that with more time points and more analysis, you could come up with a better sort of pseudo time analysis that we were able to do and get a sense of that. Um, but we didn't have enough closely spaced time points to do that. Do you um, think that's feasible? No. Go on, sorry. Do you think that's feasible to kind of have, I don't know like how precise those time points are in terms of, you know, how many of them you would need to take to capture that? I, I don't know either. I don't know either. All I know is we didn't have enough. Um, it's certainly feasible in the sense that, you know, when you crush the optic nerve, you're crushing all of the ganglion cells instantaneously and simultaneously. Um, so I don't see why it wouldn't be possible, but um, we, we haven't tried and, and, and I, it'd be kind of prohibitively expensive, frankly. Yeah, thank you. 
So we have a last four question, uh, Josh, and then we'll go to this beautiful man in wonderful sweater who is going to make a final comment, uh, Don Zach, but still four more questions. John. Oh, Dr. Sainz, thank you for this talk. Uh, I just have a couple of na possibly naive questions. Um, I was just wondering, uh, is there a significance to having an ever increasing number of cell types and subtypes? Um, is there like an evolutionary importance to having so many and the number ever increasing? Does that confer more of a certain property or and um, why certain cell types have an even greater number of subtypes than others? Um, okay, so for the first, our speculation is kind of related to what I said about midgets. Um, that is that as we get to animals with bigger cortices um, that do more of their vision processing in the cortex, it seems that they get a predominant input, which is a little more pixel-like. Basically, it's been gently processed to enhance edges, but isn't feature detecting anymore. And the idea that we have is that feature detection is now being turfed back to the cortex and that you don't need it so much in the retina. In fact, it might even be uh, harmful in the retina because you want to have the flexibility to figure out what's going on in your cortex and then respond in the flexible ways that we know about. And so as a consequence, feature detecting types of ganglion cells may have sort of languished. Whereas in mice, um, which have a pathetic cerebral cortex uh, or chicks or fish, which basically have no cerebral cortex, there's a big advantage to doing fast and complicated imaging processing in the retina to supply the colliculus with the ability to respond reflexively and rapidly. So that'd be my speculation. Thank you. Caroline. Um, hi, Dr. Kane. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, my question was regarding the overexpression experiments. So do you believe that maybe combination of overexpression associated with simultaneous enhancing of signaling pathways could strengthen the rescue of the RGCs to reach clinical significance? I mean, I don't know, but I think it's certainly an idea worth testing. I mean, you know, a lot of these neuropeptides use common downstream signaling pathways, um, and one could imagine that you could go downstream and tweak them. Again, this is something Nick, uh, Tran, and Ann Jacoby are going to pursue in their own labs, and Jagong, of course, in his lab. Emily. Hi, Dr. Sainz. Um, thank you for that great talk. Uh, I think my question might have been partially answered in, in your answer to John's question. Um, I was wondering if uh, kind of, well, your speculation on why certain cell types are more conserved or the function that it serves for each species. Um, but it seems like it once we get to different species in the is it like the brain or the cortex kind of takes over more of the visual processing so they need less of those types of cells? Is that from my understanding or am I completely way off? No, I mean, that's my thought about amor uh, about retinal ganglion cells and, and, and maybe amacrine cells. I mean, it's kind of interesting that among mammals, the number of photoreceptor horizontal and bipolar cell types is almost completely constant. Um, and, and so again, purely speculatively, you could imagine that the outer retina is sort of a perfectly constructed uh, signal processing unit or graphics card, let's say, um, and evolution sees no need to tamper with it. And then it tampers as you move towards the rest of the brain. I don't. Uh, Dr. Sainz, thank you so much for your great talk. Um, so I have a naive question about the developmental uh, development of retina in human and mouse. So let's say uh, during the development, different precursor cells in different lineages give rise to that specific uh, uh, different numbers of retinal cells. When you compare human and mouse, do you think they start from the different numbers of precursor cells give rise to like 100 cells? Wow. So um, 
I mean, people don't know that at that level so much about primates. Um, what we know from work of several labs, probably Connie kind of Sepko most of all, is that there are multiprogenitors that give rise to all the cell classes. Um, that is the photoreceptor, horizontal, bipolar, amacrine, uh, ganglion cell, Mueller glia. Um, much less is known about how the types are generated within the classes. Um, so we've done some studies on retinal ganglion cells, and it looks like they get their identity after they're born, post gradually and post mitotically. So we don't think that they're different um, progenitors for different ganglion cell types, uh, but we also don't know a lot about how they diversify. And I think the same is true for bipolar cells, although uh, Connie Sepko is working hard on that and, and has some interesting ideas that I don't want to try to state for her. Josh, I know you were waiting uh, for final comments about your research and uh, presentation and uh, maybe a question. So let's turn to uh, Don Zach uh, with his final thoughts. I don't know how much you were waiting, Josh, but uh, as, as has been said multiple times already, you know, thank you for beautiful talk integrating so much complex data. Uh, actually, I actually have two questions. One is in terms of the injury and regeneration specific changes in gene expression, how similar or different and what can you learn by comparing retinal ganglion cells to uh, spinal cord neurons or brain neurons or peripheral neurons, how, how similar are the pathways and how different? And the second question is, although as a transcriptomic person, I obviously really like looking at transcriptomes, but now that protein single cell data is available, how much have you or others compared single cell protein data versus single cell RNA? And is there anything we can learn more generally between transcriptional versus post-transcriptional regulation of these important processes? And thanks again. Yeah, okay, two great questions. So first, to the extent we've looked at uh, DRG transcriptomics after CRUSH. Th there are some similarities, but we, we should probably do more of this, but we don't see sort of similar modules that pop out. Um, Zhigong is getting together a data set of upper motor neurons following spinal cord injury. And I think that's going to be really valuable to look at, but they're still processing that. Um, so, so I don't, I don't really, uh, know too much about that. There aren't that many others that we can compare. Um, in terms of proteomics, you know, I think you're, you're absolutely right that there's no end of uh, post-transcriptional processing. Um, and so protein abundance, although they're extremely highly correlated with RNA abundance, are not perfectly correlated. Um, and so we're missing all of that. We're missing all the post-translational modifications. Um, you know, we, we came at it from the perspective of looking for cell types. And I think for that, transcriptomics is perfect. Right. For looking at what it means, for example, in the context of injury, definitely one will need to look at the protein level. Um, but I, I guess I'd still argue that finding the proteins to look at may still best be done through a transcriptomic approach. All right, let's thank uh, Josh for absolutely outstanding presentation. Thank you very much. Hope to see many of you in person someday. Thank you. Bye-bye.